<laughs> Believe me. Amen. Gail Ripplinger, professor in college, though, found out that that King James Bible had power in it. Was it school up there where they shut those people? Uh, Kent State. Kent State. I remember when that happened. She was professor at Kent State. And she found out the King James Bible. Turn the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7 with me tonight. Deuteronomy 7 and verse number 1. Deuteronomos is where you get Deuteronomy. That literally means namos is law. Deuteronomy is a second law. It's the second giving of the law. That's what it means. Chapter 7 verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, it has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And these are the ones who are in Jerusalem. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Father, I pray now, thou anoint your holy word as it goes forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Consider tonight people that had been slaves for over 400 years, generation after generation after generation, had known only grinding slavery. And so therefore, as an identity as a nation with the leadership necessary for a nation, an army and all of that, they knew nothing of that, knew absolutely nothing. And God had delivered them from Egyptian bondage with an outstretched arm, he said. He judged all the gods of Egypt. And on the night of the Passover, the death angel came through, and only the firstborn, the firstborn died of every house if the blood was not covering that house. And so he brought them out with an outstretched arm, he said, in power and might, and judged all the gods of the Egyptians. When he brought the children of Israel into the promised land, they faced a daunting foe. They were outnumbered. They had armies against them that had, that had generation after generation of of experience and so forth. And so they were outnumbered, outclassed, uh, outfought, if you say, in every sense of the word. Yet God told them, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to give it to you. It's yours. I didn't bring you from, is, I didn't bring you out of Egypt to destroy you in the wilderness, as some of them accused him of doing. I didn't do that. He said, I brought you out of that land so that you would possess this land. So I want you to notice, first of all, some things that are necessary. Look at chapter number one and verse number, uh, chapter number one and verse num chapter seven and verse one. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Do you see that? Seven nations. Seven, not just one foe. Seven, you're outnumbered. Seven of them, they are, uh, what would you, what, what if they had uh, formed an alliance that was usable? Like, you know, the allied powers had come against them and they did try that. But God Almighty gave them the victory. And so we have here, you say, well, now, preacher, don't you think this is a harsh thing? Don't you think it's a terrible thing for God to tell these people to go in and wipe these people out, to literally take them from the face of the earth? And it's important to understand something tonight. This is so important. The source of truth is through Israel. God set these people apart from all people on the face of the earth. So first of all, that the prophets would come through that people. The Word of God would come through those people. And then the Son of God would come through those people. Therefore, they are to be a light to the world. If they had been mixed up with all the other uh, nations of the earth, then the, then, then the, then the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 would have been null and void. So God saw to it that these people had exactly what they needed. Look at verse number 6 of chapter number 7. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Holy, holy, separate, separate, separate. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that you're a righteous people. He told them before you weren't righteous. It doesn't necessarily that you're good people. He said you're my people. I've separated you from all of the peoples of the earth. I didn't call you because you were good, good or, or great in number, or I saw great potential in you. He said, well, then why did he call them, preacher? Because he called them. <laughs> this is the sovereign will of God. This is an act that God does, and he doesn't have to account to anyone. 
So if you notice that in chapter number 7, he said, don't mix up with these people. Don't marry them. Don't bring them into your number. Don't you think that was, uh, don't you think that was pretty mean, preacher? No, not really. Not really. For they had to retain their identity. In Matthew chapter 1, they had to trace their genealogy back. In Luke chapter number 3, they traced their genealogy back. They knew where they came from. They knew their roots. They knew who they were. He did not want them to compromise with the people of the land. The LGBT agenda, just wait until you see what they've got in store for America and for the world. Just wait. Just watch them. Because they're not finished, folks. They've only begun. And if the church doesn't say something about it, the church is compromising. And now we've got the emerging church coming up and they're saying, well, you know, we, we're, we're, we're confused about sodomy. What are you confused about? All you've got to do is read your Bible. But what they're trying to say is that, that we want our preaching to be relevant for this pop culture today. That's what they're saying. No, I'm not interested in preaching being relevant. I'm interested in preaching being the Word of God. What does God's Word say? That's, as I said to you this morning in the message, it's not up to me to get up and cherry pick portions of the Bible and then try to feed you that as if I'm controlling your thinking and I'm controlling what God says. Just open the book up and read it. Just take it for what it says. And so he wanted to stop the compromise. Notice the second thing he says to them in chapter number 7, verses 17 and 18. He said to them, And if thou shalt say in thine heart, These nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shalt well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all the Egyptians. Notice carefully now, notice. God will prevail. He will. Look at verse 22. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. There's a way to go about the work of God. There's a reason God has behind the way He does things. Sometimes He tells us why He's doing something. Sometimes He doesn't tell us why. Sometimes He tells us beforehand what He's going to do. Sometimes He does not tell us beforehand what He's going to do. But the bottom line is the Lord is the one in charge. Did you know that if this country got on its knees and the few people left in this nation who called themselves Christians really begin to call upon the name of the Lord, you'd see this country turn around? You understand? You realize the power? Do you realize the power that's in the Word of God? The power of the Holy Spirit of God? This country could be turned around. For these young people growing up, what are they going to grow up into? We're possessing the land or is it possessing us? I'm afraid it's the other way around. If we got serious with Lord, you'd see something change. Little by little, he said, that I'll take the land. Little by little, this victory upon that victory upon that victory. In plain words, your victories are built upon victories that are built upon victories. Do you remember what Brother McNeese said the other night when they went to AI? They had just destroyed Jericho, the walls had fallen down. you remember that? And they got, they, they, got, they, got, they got proud. I mean, they got self-sufficient because they had seen the enemy run. And then a little AI ran, caused them to run. Why? Because they had not called upon the name of the Lord. If they had called upon the name of the Lord, God would have said, They're sent in the camp. For Achan had taken of the accursed thing. They didn't do it. They relied on past victories for future victories and it will never work. Say it again. They relied on past victories for future victories. And it doesn't work. For God doesn't have to do it the same way every time. But victories do lie before us. If you get serious about it with God. So the Bible tells us here, fear not, fear not. Look at chapter number 8 and verse number 11. Deuteronomy 8.11. He's preparing His people. He's getting them ready for their enemy. And here's what He says. Chapter 8 verse 11. Beware, lest thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping His commandments and His judgments and His statutes, which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, watch, watch this, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. That is so much like us. 
Because once we've been fed well and we get to, and and we and we and we get complacent and we and we just kind of laid back laissez faire cavalier attitude, then you see what Satan does because he never stops. <laughs> Satan doesn't take breaks. <clears throat> he intends to destroy you, and he intends to destroy the church. And so he said to them, "You're going to get." To, he said, "You're going to get lazy." You're going to quit praying. You're going to quit reading your Bible. You're going to quit seeking the face of God. You're going to think that you came in here and you destroyed these people by your own power, he said to them. And it will never happen that way. In the book, of, uh, in the book of, of Revelation, he said to the church of Laodicea, the church of the rights of the people. That's what the word means. It's a conjunction of two words. Laos, people. Decea. Uh, rights of the people. They said, we are rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. And God said, don't you know that you're wretched and miserable, naked and poor and blind? You can't see. You have no clothes on. You're empty. You're dead. You're twice dead and plucked up by the roots. We have good buildings. We have air conditioning. We have musical equipment. We have sound systems. We've got carpeted floors, padded pews. We've got beautiful. All of this is beautiful. This is wonderful. But what happened to the people who worshipped in a... In, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a log cabin with a pot-bellied stove. What happened to them? What happened to the Spirit of God that was with them? That's what we need today. This is, you notice, folks, dear friends, you didn't build a house for God. You built it for yourself. <laughs> he doesn't dwell in houses made with hands. The Lord doesn't get hot or cold. He doesn't need air conditioning. He doesn't need padding. This is for us. So we should welcome Him into His house. And the Bible says that the, that the Spirit of God that builds this house, one brick upon another upon another, becomes the habitation of God through the Spirit. He walks in the midst of His people, not in the midst of padded pews. And there's nothing wrong with your padded pews. But He walks in the midst of that house that He built. We are a, built, we are a royal priesthood, a habitation of God. And all it takes, it's, it's as simple as it can be tonight. All it takes is back to the f square one, back to the root, the first love, and start praying again and reading your Bible again and coming back to where you belong. But prosperity, prosperity got them. Look at chapter number 8 and verse 18. Deuteronomy 8.18 but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee power to get wealth. Look at that. It is He that giveth thee power to get wealth. You hear an awful lot of preaching about people who have nothing. And you've got a lot of people that have nothing. My mother, every time I went to Chicago, she took me to Skid Row. I don't know why it was so important to take her son to Skid Row. But she said, now son, she said there are doctors and lawyers, there are bankers... You got people on Skid Row that at one time had everything, and now look at them, they're on Skid Row. They're on Skid Row. I guess she did that to think, well, maybe I may wind up on Skid Row one day. And we could wind up on Skid Row. I could wind up sleeping under a bridge somewhere. I could wind up broke. I could wind up everything, every earthly possession that I have. I could lose everything I've got. So how do I hold on to it, preacher? Hold on to God. Do you know what gives God glory? It is that man or that woman that says, Lord, you put food on my table. You put clothes on my back. You gave me the car I drive. You gave me the house I live in, the clothes. You gave me everything. It's from you, Lord. And this is the blessing of God. This is how God blesses His people. One of the ways, the greatest way that God blesses you is with Himself. <laughs> Amen. Because that can't be bought. That can't be bought. So He said... You're rich and increased in goods. And He gives us power to get wealth. And what you have today are people that run into the ground. Prosperity preachers, prosperity, prosperity. They're like, did you know folks that there are people out here in the world that never read the Bible? They don't know the Bible. But every time they turn their TV on or the radio, all they hear is prosperity, prosperity. They think that's all the Bible talking about. Isn't that sad? Look at chapter number 9 and verse number 4. Deuteronomy 9, 4. Speak not thou in thine heart... After that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. 
But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord hath dri doth drive them out from before thee. See that contrast and the parallel? He didn't drive them out because you're good. He drove them out because they're bad. <laughs> That's all. Comparing themselves with themselves, they're not wise. We're not better than anybody. I'm not any better than anybody on this earth. But I'm born again. And so there's two of me tonight. There's the old man, the old man, the old man. But there's the new man that is renewed daily in the image of Christ. His mind is renewed, refreshed every day of my life. The Lord Jesus Christ becomes my life. That new man that walks in the newness of the Spirit. There's a new man, folks. 27 years, the old man was the only man I knew. And then in 1973, God saved me. Somebody sent me an email. I've had a number of them. They send me, they, they'll write me an email and they'll say, Preacher, I know what year you got saved. <laughs> Said, you've told us enough. Well, let me tell you something. I'm going to keep telling it until I'm gone from this world. I'm going to keep telling it. 1973, 27 years old. I became a child of God. Amen. God saved my soul. Wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. I raised my head saved. I lowered it dead and I raised it saved. And nothing can change that. That's why I'm here tonight, folks. My daddy wasn't a preacher. My grandfather wasn't a preacher. I didn't come from a home of preachers. If you did, good for you. God bless you. But I did not. God Almighty saved me and called me by His grace. I give Him glory tonight for everything. I do. Everything, every stitch I've got, everything I've got, the ministry, the church that God's put me here to pastor, not because of my righteousness, but because of His glory and His goodness. And God glorifies in that. He glorifies Himself in it. Moses reminds these Jews, now chapter number 9 and verse number 7, he reminds them of what kind of people they've been. When they start getting puffed up about, their, about how, how conquering they are, how they've overcome their enemy, how that they've put, the, they've, put the, they've put the old man to bed, they put him to sleep. Don't you ever think you have? But in chapter number 9 and verse number 7, Moses said, Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt till you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb you provoked the Lord to wrath. So the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. And then he said, I went up and I prayed for you. The only reason that Israel made it as a nation is because they had an intercessor. Boy, what a lesson. They had one man that could get a hold of God. One man that could stand before God face to face. Amen. God said, you can't even come up and touch this mountain or you'll die on the spot. But He would let Moses come before His glory and speak to Him face to face. Amen. The children of Israel saw His acts, the Bible said, and Moses saw His ways. Amen. You follow Him here. And so, we read where Moses says to them, you provoked Him in the wilderness. They did. They got tired of manna. They wanted something to drink. Moses wound up disobeying God and smiting the rock a second time. Got into all kinds of trouble in the wilderness. Then they came to Kadesh Barnea. Holy Barnea is what that means. The spies brought back an evil report from Hebron. But if, if they had only listened to Joshua and Caleb, they would have gone into the land because they told them they could. So there's rebellion again. Then they had raised up a golden idol, an idol of Apis the bull. And here we have them at the base of the mountain of Sinai, the holy mountain of God. And here they are down here creating a, a God like the gods that they'd seen, something that they were familiar with, something that, that they could identify with. Don't ever let the world tell you, don't ever let the world identify God for you, okay? Don't ever let this world tell you who the Lord Jesus Christ is. If you get on the internet and Google the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll get everything under the sun. You will, believe me. They will, they, they have every kind of an identification in the world for the Son of God except the right one. And you know the sad thing is that most of the churches today don't even know who He is? Amen. This is why I get, that's why I spend so much time teaching and talking about the God man. The Son of God came down from heaven. The God man went back. Amen. Exalted to the right hand of the Father. God Almighty became a man. That's quite a remarkable thing when you think about it. But he reminded them of where they came from and what they'd been. So any time that we get all puffed up and think we're so great and that we've accomplished so much, God can remind us real quickly where we came from. And he can let you stumble too. And he'll stumble over the old man. And you can be reminded that that old man never did die. You'll never put him to death. You'll never put him to bed. 
He'll be with you until the end of this world. I want you to notice the last thing. Chapter number 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. He quotes all these laws. Remember, Deuteronomos is the second giving of the law. Exodus chapter number 20, you have ten commandments, ten of them. Mammonides, Mammonides was a Jewish sage. He is called a Rambam. He is, a, he is an exalted teacher in rabbinic Judaism. Mammonides is the man who, who codified the Talmud. The Talmud is the book that the Jew lays down next to the Bible. And instead of reading the Bible, he'll read his Talmud. And it is the Talmud that blinds him to who Christ is. Right. Mammonides was one of the smartest that they ever had. Mammonides said that there are 613 commandments in the Torah. Yeah. 613. 613 commandments. That's a lot of commandments, isn't it? Right. The Bible said the laws are made for law, law breakers. Laws are made for law breakers. The external control of someone. Once you ha when you have to be controlled externally, then you have been reduced to the point of a beast. You build fences and gates for beast. Are you following me now? Have you ever seen a man stand at the gate and reason with a bunch of cattle? There's nothing to reason with. You put the, you put the animals and the beast and you lock them up. Because it's necessary to externally control them. God gave them laws that were written in stone that controlled them from the outside in the beginning. But He was preparing them for the time when He would put His laws on the inside. And it would no longer be gates and fences to direct and control His people. But now He'd raise them to a higher level. So when Mammonides said there are 613 laws... In the in the in the uh, Talmud, the, the Torah, the t the Talmud is the commentary on the Torah, the Gemara, and the the Midrash, and all of that. When he came out with all of that, it's not as if you can open it up and you have a list of six hundred and thirteen laws. It's not like that. They went in there and they pulled this one out, and they pulled that one out, and they pulled this one and pulled that one. Then by the time they got through, he had six hundred and thirteen of them. Look at the New Testament text about this. Look at chapter number 12, 10 rather, of Deuteronomy, verse 12, and then go to Mark 12, 29. Deuteronomy chapter number 10 and verse number 12. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? What does He require of thee? I mean, that's pretty simple, straightforward, isn't it? I mean, if you want to live for the Lord in the Old Testament time, how do you live for Him? Here's what He says. What doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Isn't that something? Now go to Mark chapter number 12, verse 29. Remember, they have that Old Testament lying right before them when they quote it. The Lord Jesus Christ quoted the Old Testament time and time and time and time again. Mark chapter 12, verse 29. Now if you look at verse number 28, you'll get a context, you'll get a sense of what's going on. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceived that he'd answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? All right, now look at this. See? They're reasoning about commandments. Now watch it, verse 29. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is here, is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Amen. Now hold your place there, go to Exodus 20. Let's go to Exodus chapter number 20. What's in Exodus 20, preacher? Verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything. And on he goes. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. What have you got there in Exodus 20? The Ten Commandments. That's the Ten Commandments. Exactly. That's the Ten Commandments. The Western civilization, whether it likes to admit it or not, is based on that principle right there. The Ten Commandments. Absolutely. Now, but there's something here that he's quoted back in Mark chapter number 12. In verse 29, the first of all the commandments. Well, that's not what it says in Exodus 20. He must be referring to another commandment. See, you won't find it in Exodus 20. Turn to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. He said, you want commandments? Do you want me to quote commandments? Well, I'm going to raise you up now. And I'm going to quote one for you. Now, if you go to Deuteronomy 6, 4 with a Jew, he's going to tell you that that is the Shema. That's what he calls it. The Shema. What's that mean? That means that there is no commandment higher than this one. Look at it in verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, he is one Lord. Go back to Mark 12. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Did he quote that? Absolutely. And he just told you that that is the first of all the commandments. Now look at the next one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. In plainer words, he said, all the rest of the commandments rest on this. Because if they're not resting on this, they're nothing in the world more than legalistic attempt to please God from a heart that is not connected with Him. It's your effort, whatever your motive may be, it's your effort to please God without the heart being connected with him. Plain words, God said, I want you to get to the point to where when you see commandment, you're saying, I've got something in my heart that loves you. And I delight in thy word. Now look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Now who wrote Ecclesiastes? Exactly. Look at chapter number 12 and verse number 13. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Now Solomon said this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. There's something missing here. What's missing? What's right? That's his nature. That's his essence. This is why they reject the Trinity. They don't believe in the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. What did he say? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And notice how that Solomon wrote this, and there's not a word about love. You know why? I believe this is why. I believe Solomon came back to God. The reason I believe it is because he wrote Ecclesiastes. And I believe, I believe he wrote it late in life. And I believe his heart had been so scarred by what he had endured and what he'd been, what he tasted, the sin that he tasted. It was so scarred that he found a hard, he found it very difficult to love the Lord thy God. So the rest of his life, he feared him. And did the best he could to keep his commandments. But he'd been scarred. Do you know what he says in Jeremiah 31 about Israel? Turn over there with me. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, 
that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with them, their fathers, in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, this is Jehovah, see the capital L-O-R-D, I will put my law, where? In their inward parts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now you can take the time to read Hebrews 8, and you can see where the new covenant, the writer of Hebrews applies it, when it's going to be applied, who it's applied to. It's not Gentiles. In Hebrews chapter number 8, it's the house of Israel. If you are a main line Protestant that has robbed Israel of their rightful place in the Bible, you've got a mess on your hands in Hebrews chapter number 8. But I don't do that because the day is going to come when God's going to deal with Israel as a people. He's going to appear to them. And here's what he said. The first time I gave you a law, I wrote it in stone. And that all of that I gave you was from the outside telling you what holiness was about, who I was, how separate I was from you. But he said, I want to bring you to a place to where I can write it in your heart so you don't need stone to carry around. It's in your heart. Wherever you go, that law is written in your heart. And the reason it's written in your heart and has basis and validity is because you love me. If you really know the Lord, if you've ever really met him and you know him and you've lived for him, you love him. Because you learn something about him. You learn something about God. And the more you learn about him, you love him. You love him. You show me a man that, that, that presents the Lord God as some kind of an ogre up in heaven with a ball bat ready to beat you into hell at the first moment that something goes wrong. I'm going to show you right now that man doesn't have any idea who he is. He isn't trying to cause you to stumble. No, he's not. he doesn't seek your damnation. He's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Who goes to hell, preacher? A man that chooses to go to hell. <laughs> you chose it. And you rejected God. You rejected the truth. You rejected Christ. But the door is wide open for any man to accept Him. And when you bring Him into your heart, and once you've known Him, once you've lived for Him, once you begin to understand Him, you'll love Him. And there is no higher commandment than that one. That's what He told them in Mark 12. There's no higher commandment than this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, body, everything that makes you what you are. But you see, you can't preach that to a bunch of jaded people who have redefined the word love. This jaded generation today, when you say the word love, they think of nothing but themselves. And so how everything relates to them. So how does God relate to me? No. How do you relate to God? But you've got to get the attention of this jaded generation. They don't appreciate that. They have no concept of it. Thou shalt love Him. Do you love Him? If you love Him, all the rest of His commandments will be taken care of. Every one of them. They'll be taken care of. Because you'll want to live for Him because you love Him. <laughs> you don't need a fence and you won't need a gate. You won't need a cattle prod. You won't need somebody kicking you. You won't need somebody pushing you, coercing you, prodding you. You'll live for Him because you love Him. And there's nothing higher than that. Father, in Thy name I pray. Bless Your Holy Word. You've been good to me, Lord. You've been very, very, very good to me. Bless these folk who've heard your word tonight. Bless every one of them. May your word take root. May it produce fruit in due time. In the time that, that uh, Heavenly Father, you know. You know when. You know where. And I pray for them. In Jesus' sweet, holy, righteous name I pray. Bless the Son. Bless His name. Amen. 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 Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. You stand up tonight. What do you, what do you got, brother? Page 401 in the All American Church Hymnal.
trust Him. Only trust Him. Only trust Him. Amen. Only trust Him. Only trust Him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Folks, take home what I said with you. You take it home. Think on it. Meditate on it. As the Bible said, Mary pondered those things in her heart that Gabriel had told her. And so uh, take the Word of God and chew on it a while. Amen. Uh, you're invited to stay here and have some uh, ice cream and hot dogs and whatever else is here. I'll we'll have a word of prayer and let you go. And while we pray, let's thank God for the food. And then you can go on and, and, uh, and go on up there. Father, I thank You for this day, Lord. You've been good to me. You let me stand for You one more time. I could never repay You. I bless Your righteous name. You know, Lord, You know in my heart how much I love You. You know that. And I bless your name. Bless the food. Thank you for it. Thank you, Father, for what we have here. You've been good to us at Temple. I ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake, I pray. Amen.